All right, this is your video for 14.3. Uh, spatial differences in gene expression lead to uh, morphogenesis. Now, uh, leading into this lecture, we've been looking at uh, the four processes of development being determination, uh, which is you know determining what the fate of the cell is, differentiation as the different types of cells arise. Okay, now we're at morphogenesis. Now the fourth stage, growth, we're not necessarily gonna talk about um, we're just mainly going to be focusing on the first three, but you are still going to be responsible for knowing about growth because obviously once uh, morphogenesis or the, um, the the formation of the uh, the different um, forms of the body, once they've been developed and they start to um, become distributed throughout the embryo, right, then they'll start to grow and then undergoing mass quantities of, uh, of mitosis to create a larger organism. Okay, so um, again, first we had determination, right? Determining what the fate is. Second, differentiation. Third, morphogenesis. And then fourth, growth. So this is going to focus on morphogenesis. Okay. So um, first we have pattern formation, right? Because the whole idea of morphogenesis is to create that form of body, meaning where are these tissues going to be in relation to each other? Okay, uh, so... He says pattern formation, the process that results in the spatial organization of tissues linked to morphogenesis, which is the creation of the body form, meaning how are those different parts of those or how are those different tissues now going to be arranged to make up the entire organism. So the spatial differences in gene expression depend on um, a couple things. One, cells in the body must know where they need to be in relation to the other body, uh, body parts, and then they must be um, activated uh, in an appropriate pattern with appropriate timing um, of gene expression, okay? So um, even though we don't really talk about it as much, because um, we're mainly talking about mitosis and cell growth and, and the development of all these tissues, understand that the development of these tissues um, is going to require the death of some cells. Um, for example, uh, as you see here in the image right here, as the... Um, the fingers and toes and our, our digits are developing as an embryo, we kind of have the webbed, uh, you know, webbed feet or in webbed fingers. But um, over time, the cells that are in the webs uh, are going to die off, which allows us to um, have fingers and toes, right? So even though we're mainly thinking of, you know, development as the growth and, or not the growth, but the, uh, the, um, the propagation of cells, it's also going to involve the death of cells uh, to make sure that the right types of cells are, um, even though they may not be long term, the, the right types of cells are present. And then, of course, when it comes time in the developmental stage, for example, from day 41 to day 56, um, we don't still have webbed hands and webbed feet. Okay. So um, I want to talk about. Um, the uh, the plant prospect here or the plant uh, um, observation, which is going to deal with um, pretty much the the uh, the expression or the um, the identity of the organs or what we call it says right here the organ identity genes. Okay, there is going to be different portions of the flower that are going to uh, develop into different parts of, or different portions of the um, the meristem. Right, that early, early flower differentiation before they really um, developed into, you know, their main organ. Okay, uh, they'll have um, a series of genes that will help identify which organ it's going to develop into. So in this case, we have flowers, which uh, this I can't remember the name of this flower is off the top of my head, but um, this is. A flower that has four, body, you know, four main organ types of flowers. Okay, we have sepals, which are on the outside of the flowers, kind of like if you ever think of a rose, it's the green part of the. It looks like it's the bulb, right? That green portion that goes over the petals. And then, of course, we have the petals. We have the stamen, which is the um, uh, housing the male organ, and then the carpal, which is going to uh, house the female sex organs. Okay. Now, I just want to remind you that this is just an example. This is one, um, this is one part of a, of a plant. We're talking about the flower right here, which has those specific organs. Um, if we deal with other parts of the plant, then we may have a different series of organs. 
but the um, and like I said, it's just an example. This is kind of a good basis as to um, uh, how plants are going to undergo uh, morphogenesis. Okay. Um, also, we like flowers, right? So different classes of genes would result in um, for the formation of different organs. So here I have class A, class B, class C. Okay. So class A is going to be responsible for, uh, it's going to be expressed in the sepals and petals. Class B is expressed in the petals and stamens. Class C is expressed in the stamens and the carpels. So a combination of these genes could result in the, um, the development of a certain organ. So for example, if class A and B, okay, um, if those two genes are expressed, then that will result in the... Um, the uh, uh, the expression of the eventual petal, so all the genes that are responsible for um, the genes responsible for making the petal organ, okay? And of course, we have a uh, variety, right, of different um, parts of these flowers, and um, these flowers, like the sepal, the petal, the stamen, they can be a combination of these, what we call whorls, okay? And these whorls being, you know, nothing more than just a um, kind of a, co a collection of um, segments of the meristem that are responsible for these organ parts. Okay. Um, now, how they were able to determine that these uh, whorls and this whole idea of organ identity gene um, is actually true is they do what they, you know, do with most genetic information is they introduce the concept of mutation in there. And, you know, as it turns out, if you have um, genes turned on or genes turned off or you increase the genes or you have a gain of function mutation versus a loss of function mutation, um, you can actually have different parts of the flower not even form. Um, like, for example, if um, uh, worlds three and four, which contain uh, gene C, if we had some sort of, um, I guess, misproduction or lack of production of gene C and lack of expression of gene C, uh, the carpel would not even form, and in fact, the stamen would be, um, I guess, inhibited in some way, so it may be malformed, right? And in some cases, you could have different parts of the flower try to compensate for that by um, growing into, like, for example, having where the stamen is, um, you may have some sepal organ material there, which obviously isn't going to produce a functional uh, organism. Um, now you're thinking, well, yeah, that's a flower, that's interesting, but you're actually going to see at the end of this lecture that it can actually happen in animals too. Um, we're actually going to see what happens to a fruit fly if we have some um, uh, disorder in the uh, expression of some of these genes. Okay. So um, the fate of the cell is often determined where the cell is, right? Its actual location, or what we call positional information, right? It comes in um, the form of an inducer. This inducer is called a morphogen, okay? Now, a morphogen is a, um, I guess, just, it's a, well, I guess the easiest way to put it, it's a chemical that is going to um, govern where certain, um, certain uh, expression of genes is going to be placed. Okay, so um, this morphogen, this chemical, is going to diffuse from one group of cells to another group, setting up a concentration gradient, and that concentration gradient will result in the expression of different genes. Okay, so um, obviously you need to be very specific, and um, the different concentrations of those morphogens could result in different effects. For example, here I have these six cells, right? This is what we call the, the French flag model, right? Here's my six different cells, and the amount of morphogen, the concentration of that chemical in these different cells, as you can tell, is the increasing is decreasing from left to right. Well, the decreasing of that is going to result in um, the uh, uh, in the the change of or the change of chance of inducing the blue fate versus the white fate versus the red fate. Right. Obviously, if you have a very very low uh, morphogen count, then it's going to result in those cells being in the uh, red fate. If you have an, a moderate amount, that's going to be the white fate. If you have uh, a high amount of that morphogen, it could result in blue fate. Um, now, like I said, these, this is just a very generalized example, but 
all this is showing you is the concentration of this morphogen directly relates to um, what type of expression of genes is going to be occurring in these cells. And in doing so, kind of gives some sort of spatial distribution among the different parts of uh, the organism or different cells within this very, very early stage of life. Here in this example, looking at the, you know, the French flag model, if I was to look at um, a limb of an embryo, um, in this case, the little limb bud, you'd have uh, a certain uh, morphogen in higher concentrations. Okay, if you look down at the hand, um, the higher concentrations of the morphogen, in this case, uh, ZPA or sh whichever one you wanted to, to go with anyways, I'm not really worried about the specifics of what the morphogen or the different types of morphogen, just know that morphogen concentration is going to have an effect on the types of um, organization of the different tissues. Okay, for example, here, like I said, looking at the hand, if you have a high concentration of the um, uh, of the morphogen, it could that usually signals for the production of the middle uh, the uh, pinky finger. If you have a very low, then that's going to signal the production of a thumb. Okay. So several types of genes are expressed uh, sequentially to define these segments. So these are the main three guys right here. All right. Um, we have maternal effects, which honestly just talks about the cytoplasmic determinants within the egg, talking about setting it up, the you know setting up the polar, uh, the um, the uh, the different proteins or the different transcription factors or the different RNAs that are going to be uh, distributed throughout the uh, the egg at that time or even the zygote at that time. Uh, segmentation genes, which are going to determine the boundaries and the polarity of that molecule of the um, uh, of the cell. So, for example, the top and the bottom, because that's pretty much what all polarity is. It's the top and the bottom of an organism, or in this case, of a cell or what will become a larger organism. And then lastly, um, the idea of Hox genes. Okay, and these genes will determine which organs will be made at a given location within these different segments. Okay, so taking a look at, say, this diagram right here, this is of uh, Drosophila, okay, a fruit fly. Um, I may have different bands of these segments, right? And each one of these different band colors could result in the different formation of organs, and those organ formation is going to be directly linked to the Hox genes that are going to be expressed. So here you go. Hox genes are expressed in different combinations along the length of the embryo. They determine cell fates within each segment and direct cells to become certain structures such as eyes or wings. Okay, Hox genes are homeoetic genes, which means they, um, they are found within what we call the homeobox, which is where um, the, the, the determination of the, the organs are going to be. So um, odd thing, or not necessarily that odd, but all Hox genes are shared among all animals. Okay, um, the, the, the segmentation and the organ production is very similar from one species to the next. And, you know, like always, uh, all we can do is pretty much screw with the genetic material to see if um, mutants are going to behave differently. And, of course, in this case, they do. There's two um, uh, main mutations that they're looking at when it came to looking at Hox genes and the clues, like they say, to Hox gene form uh, function. Okay, We have the uh, Antenopedia mutation, um, which they are going to switch. So, for example, if I was to look at this picture right here, and let's say in the, well, I'm looking at the bottom uh, right-hand corner, okay, and let's say that we uh, flip-flopped, um, or not even flip-flopped, let's say we replaced the blue, or the orange section with blue section, okay? So they did a, a large, you know, a forced mutation to see what would happen if I mixed up these Hox genes and I changed their orientation, well, here are the results. This is Drosophila, right, uh, pointing at the antenna. Now, the two parts that I mixed right there, that is, or I flipped around, that's the antennapedia mutation, okay? And what that's eventually going to result in is legs growing where the antenna should be, right? So, um, like I said, it doesn't just happen in plants where the sepal may grow where the, um, where the carpal is. In this case... We have legs growing out of the head of a fly, and because of an induced mutation to determine the uh, the importance of Hox genes. 
Okay. Uh, the other mutation is the uh, bithorax, which in this case, um, we all are familiar with, you know, the three parts of the, the insect, right? We have the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Well, the idea of the uh, bithorax, bi meaning two, it's they did a duplication. So let's say uh, the green section, I'm looking at the same one, the same little uh, embryo down here. I'm looking at that green section. What if I duplicated that green section, right? Well, in duplicating that green section, and I don't have a picture of this one, so I'm sorry. Um, but if you duplicate that, then you're going to end up getting two uh, thorax. And because you have two thorax, each thorax has um, a pair of wings. Or sorry, the thorax has a pair of wings, so you actually end up having, uh, instead of a pair of wings on the thorax and a pair of wings on the abdomen, it ends up having six wings because there's two thorax. Okay? So um, if you guys have any questions, by all means, let me know. Um, but that's pretty much it for this section.